Tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video drops. Also at 9 p.m. Eastern, join me live on Twitch where we'll talk about anything and everything in our weekly Q&A stream. Link to join below. And now, on with our feature presentation. When the NFL went on strike in 1987, it was complete and utter chaos. And that's putting it mildly. Because now, when the owners decided that it was not going to be like 1982, and they were going to play through the strike with or without real players, you had teams that had to manage two completely different sets of teams. You had to not only manage the relations of the players who were striking, who would be back when the strike ended, and you might even cross the picket line, but you had to manage an entirely different team of players who were out of the league and might never play again after the strike is over. You had to fill out an entire roster in a matter of days, get them into game shape, and get them ready to play football not even 10 days after they were working a regular 9-to-5 job. And if you think it's hard to find a good quarterback as it is, think of how hard it is to find a good quarterback off the street that wasn't good enough for the NFL at first. So naturally, when two teams are fighting for one player, and that player happens to be a guy that the team really needs a quarterback to become a starter, things can get a bit dirty, and teams might be willing to break the rules just a little bit to make it happen, especially since the NFL had bigger things to worry about. It's like if in school, someone is breaking the rules by sitting at a lunch table that isn't the lunch table assigned to their class. Yeah, you're breaking the rules, but there's also a giant food fight happening right now in the cafeteria that the lunch attendants are trying to get under control, so they really don't care about that rule being broken. Well, the same thing applied in 1987 during the strike, when according to the Seahawks, they were trying to sign the man that you've been watching this whole time, quarterback Sammy Garza. And when they tried to do it to fix their quarterback issue, the Cardinals came in, broke the rules, and took him. It was a crazy controversy, that definitely got lost in the shuffle amongst the bigger news, which is that the regular players were striking. And it was a controversy that you might not have heard too much of, simply because it's hard to care and get too worked up about a player that you knew wasn't going to last more than a month. But that's what we're dealing with here. Because this is the story of the most controversial player signing of the 1987 strike. Before I talk about the incident in question, and what specifically the Cardinals did that had the Seahawks up in arms, we need some context to understand just who the quarterback was, and why the Seahawks were coveting him so badly. Our story begins down in El Paso, Texas, where there was a very good quarterback playing for the UTEP Miners by the name of Sammy Garza. The bad news for Garza was that he was on an absolutely putrid team, and never got a whole lot of national recognition for it. In his four seasons on the team, the final three of which he was the primary starter for, they went 9-37, winning just 19% of the time, including a 1985 season where they went 1-10. With the one win, somehow, and I have no idea how this happened, but it truly might be one of the greatest upsets in college football history, coming against a number 7 ranked BYU team that had won 30 of their last 31 games. Riddle me that. However, other than the stunning upset that took the college football world by storm, unless you were a UTEP fan, or paid close attention to the WAC, it was highly unlikely that you heard of Garza, or got to watch him play a whole lot. But that didn't mean that Garza wasn't a good quarterback. Far from it, in fact. Because during his final season with the Miners in 1986, he had a fantastic season, where he established himself as the best quarterback in the WAC, and as one of the best quarterbacks in all of college football, period. In 1986, he not only led the WAC with 3,140 passing yards, but he finished second in the entire NCAA in this category, only trailing Mike Perez of San Jose State. Garza was one of just three quarterbacks that season to throw for more than 3,000 yards, so his numbers were truly amazing. He led the WAC with 258 passes completed, which finished second in the NCAA, only behind Eric Wilhelm of Oregon State, who had 283. He threw 21 touchdown passes, which not only led the WAC, but was second in the NCAA only behind Vinny Testaverde of Miami, who threw 26. You may have heard of him before. And he was extremely accurate as well, completing 62.9% of his passes, which not only led the WAC, but was 7th in the NCAA. In other words, if there was a major passing stat in 1986, there was an extremely high chance 
that not only did Garza lead the conference in that category, but he was near the top of the NCAA in that category as well. And I could go on and on about just how many school records he set and accomplishments he held during this time, because it truly was a lot. He held the record for most passes completed in the game when he had 36 in a game against Northern Michigan. He had a game against Northern Michigan where he threw seven touchdown passes. To this day, that remains a school record, as no quarterback since him has thrown more than five in a game. He set the single season record at the time in 1986 for most passing yards, and held the career record at the time for most passing yards as well. He was responsible for 24 touchdowns in 1986, which was a school record at the time. His completion percentage of 60% in 1985 was a school record at the time, which he then broke in 1986 at 62.9%. His career completion percentage of 59.1% was also a school record at the time, and his 21 touchdown passes tied a school record at the time, alongside Billy Stevens in 1965. He also set the school record at the time for most passes completed, both in a single season and over the course of an entire career. This is just a really long-winded way of saying that Sammy Garza was really, really good. And even though the regular college football viewing public wasn't taking note, NFL teams definitely were. And one of those teams happened to be none other than the Seattle Seahawks, who drafted him in the eighth round of the 1987 NFL Draft with pick number 216, making him the third quarterback out of UTEP taken and the first and to date only player that the Seahawks have ever taken out of UTEP. Even though Garza was an eighth round pick, he was optimistic about his chances of making the roster, as he was competing in camp with Dave Craig, Jeff Kemp, Gail Gilbert, and Sean Salisbury. As Garza said, I'm the only rookie of the five, so I'm the one who really has to prove himself. But I feel like I have a good shot if they keep three quarterbacks, which is what they did last year. I feel my arms just as strong as the other guys. And it seemed like things were going well, as during a scrimmage against the Houston Oilers, different than a preseason game, he went 8 for 10 with 128 yards and two touchdowns, receiving praise from head coach Chuck Knox, who said, Garza threw the ball well. He's inexperienced and all, but he made some throws and has a good arm. However, even though things were looking up for Garza, and it was looking promising in his quest to make it onto an NFL roster, as it turned out, he never really stood much of a chance, especially since all reports indicated that Knox only wanted to keep two quarterbacks, making his uphill climb that much harder and that much steeper. It was impressive that Garza made it onto one of the final rounds of cuts, but it wasn't enough at the end of the day. Garza didn't play a single snap during the preseason, never getting the opportunity to play in a competitive environment, and quarterbacks coach Ken Meyer just didn't feel like Garza was ready enough to warrant a roster spot. As Meyer said, Sammy was just not ready. He has a lot of raw ability. I think he has somewhat of a chance to get on with another team. Sure enough, he was going to get that chance, though not in the way that anyone really saw coming. Because toward the middle of September, when the strike became official and teams were scrambling to fill the roster with replacement players, the Seahawks had a guy in mind that had potential and that knew the offense. They had none other than Sammy Garza, who was a free agent and who was available. It seemed like a perfect fit for obvious reasons, especially because a ton of teams used late round draft picks that they previously cut as replacement players, because they knew they were in game shape, knew the system, and maybe had some potential beyond the strike since they were young, unknown commodities. However, to the surprise of a lot of people, including the Seahawks, when the time came at the start of October for Garza to pick a team, he picked a completely different bird team. He picked the St. Louis Cardinals. And the reason why? Let's just say that the Cardinals may have cheated to acquire him. When it became clear that replacement players were going to be used during the strike, and that the season was not going to come to a complete halt, the NFL Management Council knew that they needed to establish some ground rules. This was a completely unprecedented situation that hadn't happened before hasn't happened since, and God willing, will never happen again. If you didn't lay down the law, it would be the wild, wild west out there, and not the enjoyable kind, but rather the 1999 Will Smith movie that very few people enjoy. 
The biggest ground rule was simple. You could not put in the contract that you promised to give a replacement player a roster spot. That is illegal. If you offer any inducements above the base salary of their last contract, or offer them a future job once the strike is done, that is not allowed, and you will be punished. You can see why this rule would be put in place. Without the rule, you would have teams just offering future jobs to everyone and anyone that they wanted in order to try and get them to come. And this would be a major problem, because without this provision, you would either have the striking players furious and taking this to court for retaliation if they lost their job for the sole reason of a replacement player guaranteed to take their spot, or you would have the replacement players claiming a breach of contract and taking this to court. Either way, it's sending in litigation. However, teams would be more than willing to offer future jobs because the end result of paying off a few players for a breach of contract and giving them their weekly salary for the entire 1987 season in expected damages would be significantly less than the financial gain you would get if you went 2-1 or 3-0 during the strike and could get into the playoffs and maybe even host a playoff game. It was totally worth it to possibly pay that fine because the monetary reward was potentially really high. Breaking the rules would have totally been worth it, so that's why you had to put that provision in place. Well, guess what the Cardinals decided to do when they signed Sammy Garza? They broke literally the only rule, and Garza's agent, Bud Hammock, was dumb enough to admit that the Cardinals were in violation of the rules. As Hammock said, it was a better situation for Sammy in St. Louis. The Seahawks just wanted to use him during the strike. It appeared the Cardinals had plans to use him after the strike. However, and this is where it gets really stupid and controversial, and shows how no one really knew what they were doing or how to handle this situation, while you couldn't write it down, if you verbally promised someone a future roster spot, then it was perfectly legal. Put it in a written contract? It's a violation of the rules set forth by the NFL Management Council. Say the same exact thing orally? You're good to go. So you can imagine that the Cardinals got Garza because they offered him this oral promise, which the Cardinals kept their word on, as even after the strike ended, Garza stayed on the roster, and because the Seahawks did not and the Cardinals had no incentive to keep Garza on their roster, as we'll find out in just a bit. And to say that the Seahawks were furious about this would be an understatement, especially since they were scrambling for a quarterback who knew the system, and Garza was their best bet. And now, they were quickly running out of time. As one Seahawks front office member said, who knew that the Cardinals were not even being the slightest bit discreet about this, they did some things they shouldn't do. It doesn't get more blunt than that. So now, on top of the strike, you had two teams bickering over a player who was going to appear in three games tops and then likely never be heard from again. As for how Garza's time in the strike turned out, even though the Seahawks lost the battle, they may have won the war. Because Garza was not very good with St. Louis, and there's a reason that the highlights package of him in the NFL that you're watching right now is extremely, and I truly mean extremely limited. He played in two games, and started the final strike game, which was a 34-28 loss to the San Francisco 49ers. Although I don't think anyone can blame the Cardinals for losing that game, seeing as Joe Montana crossed the picket line for the Niners. Over the course of the strike, he went 11-20 for 20 with 183 yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions, and a passer rating of 63.1, which was well below the league-wide average of 74 the year before. Not great by any means. So even though the Seahawks were furious about Garza winding up on the Cardinals because of some foul play, they weren't losing too much sleep after watching how it played out, especially since Garza never played another snap in the NFL again after the strike, and especially since the Seahawks went 2-1 during the strike even without Garza, and they used their strong play during this period to make it to the playoffs. But this entire situation, and this entire controversy, highlights the true competitive cutthroat nature of the NFL even during the time where it would be hard to call the NFL the NFL. Because no matter how small the stakes may seem, no matter how insignificant or bad the player may be in the grand scheme of things, and no matter how steep the potential punishment may be, of which there, amazingly enough, was not one here, a team will always try and find any way possible to gain a competitive advantage over another team. Even if they have to bend the rules a bit, 
to do it. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.